three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Hi. You've caught me enjoying something I've missed for years. Exercising. Let me take you back a few years. It all started a few days a month. Annoying but tolerable. Eventually, it became so bad I couldn't run anymore. No cardio activities, weight training, not even yoga. It got so bad. I was nearly bedbound for a few years with daily pain. It was excruciating. Okay, enough about me. Let me tell you more about the debilitating condition of diaphragmatic endometriosis. It's underrecognized, underdiagnosed, and definitely undertreated. In fact, the pain can be so severe, it sends a person to the emergency room with fear of they're having a heart attack, a blood clot in the lung, or even a lung collapse, which in fact, this condition can create. Sadly, these persons are often sent home from the emergency room with a wrong diagnosis. The frequent lack of image findings and normal blood values and oxygen levels leads frequent dismissal of their symptoms. Many women have taken to the internet are beginning to figure out their problem before the doctors. Not all women, but those who are active in online support and education groups about endometriosis. They've been learning about diaphragmatic endometriosis, how to track and record their symptoms, and seeking care on their own. This is only a wee portion of the women with the disease. The reality is, there are a lot of women with the disease and a lot of the medical providers and practitioners who have either never heard of it, don't know how to recognize the symptoms and assess for it and refer patients to the proper care, or blatantly refuse to believe it exists or it is too rare. Let's change up the scenery. That's better. Welcome to our classroom. I'm your host, Dr. Wendy Bingham, the executive director and founder of Extra Pelvic Not Rare. The details presented here about endometriosis of the diaphragm, referred to as DE, is for information purposes only. If you or someone you know is experiencing symptoms that are suspicious for diaphragmatic endometriosis, it is important to work with your medical provider to rule out other concerns before seeking consultation with a surgeon experienced in treatment of diaphragmatic endometriosis. If you are a medical provider or practitioner, I'm pleased you're here. The content in this video will expose you to statistics and characteristics of the disease, personal testimonies, and specific considerations surrounding the surgical event and multidisciplinary team that is necessary to properly treat this disease. If you encounter patients in the future that you suspect may have diaphragmatic endometriosis, it is vital that you refer them to an excision gynecologist with adequate skill and knowledge to treat the disease. Having said this, it's important that you realize that only a very small portion of gynecologists are adequately trained and experienced with such. At the present time, there's no way to know the true prevalence of diaphragmatic endometriosis. Scientific literature estimates up to 1.5% of persons with pelvic endometriosis have DE. A separate estimate has included all tissues of the respiratory system. It increases from 2.3 to 5.6% of all persons with pelvic endometriosis. Although a diagnostic code for endometriosis exists and is used to track the prevalence of surgically confirmed endometriosis across a large portion of the globe, there's no way to acknowledge endometriosis of the diaphragm specifically. To learn more about this and other major factors that contribute to the perception of rarity, please check out lesson two, is extra pelvic endometriosis rare? What is the likelihood or probability for a person to develop endometriosis of the diaphragm? A person with pelvic endometriosis is much more likely than a person without pelvic endometriosis to develop it. Among those with pelvic endometriosis, it's more common for persons with stage three and four pelvic disease to develop DE than those with stage one or two. Although the probability is low, persons can develop isolated diaphragmatic endometriosis and or lesions within the chest cavity without concurrent pelvic endometriosis. With a traditional perception that it doesn't exist or it's too rare, and the fact little to zero information about endometriosis of the diaphragm is offered in medical training from med school through post-professional education, there is a very high probability of misdiagnosed and undiagnosed persons that include a portion 
that have undergone surgical treatment by both gynecologists and non-gynecologist surgeons. Let's review some characteristics of endometriosis affecting the diaphragm. Over the course of many years, data was collected from 150 patients with diaphragmatic endometriosis. This collection occurred at a single institute where access to a multidisciplinary surgical team was available. The surgeons involved in the patient care had advanced surgical skills to include those used for oncological lesions. It's far more common for lesions to occur on the right side. There is a small percentage of persons that present with lesions on both sides of the diaphragm, and this occurs much more often than just isolated lesions on the left. Superficial disease of the diaphragm is far more common than deep disease, but it's a lot more common to find multiple lesions than just a single isolated one. Similar to endometriosis in other areas of the body, lesions present with different shapes, sizes, and colors. These characteristics, in addition to other factors, play a role in the ability of disease to be detected by imaging. The distribution of characteristics presented here among the 150 people with diaphragmatic endometriosis at this institute are similar to those reported in other publications. I quote Dr. David Redwine from his website endopedia.info. The classic symptoms of diaphragmatic endometriosis are right chest and shoulder pain prior to or during the menstrual flow. The pain can feel like it is deep in the chest with radiation to the shoulder and sometimes up the right side of the neck or into the arm. Some women state that the pain can feel like a muscular strain, even though they've not done anything particularly strenuous with their neck or arm. The pain can be aggravated with breathing, and some women have to reduce activities because deeper breathing with exercise can aggravate the pain. Some symptoms reported by persons with diaphragmatic endometriosis have included, but are not limited to, stabbing of the lower ribs of the chest and shoulder blade, shooting pains in the neck, the throat, the ear, the shoulder, and even the same sided arm, circumferential pressure around the lower ribs and chest, an increased difficulty and effort to breathe, shortness of breath, nausea, heartburn, sensations of choking, and even hiccups. Please take a few moments to read the testimonies from a few persons with surgically confirmed diaphragmatic endometriosis. Diaphragmatic endometriosis can present with a lot of symptoms suggestive of more common conditions. Some of these diagnoses that persons with the disease have received by one of their care team members or at the emergency room include asthma, appendicitis, bronchitis, costochondritis, dehydration, a touch of pneumonia, GERD, heartburn, hiatal hernia, hypochondria, muscle strain, pinched nerve, pleurisy, primary spontaneous pneumothorax, gallbladder, disease, thoracic outlet syndrome, neuropathy, pulmonary embolism, and viruses. There is one distinguishing characteristic that separates diaphragmatic endometriosis from all the others. DE has a catamenial trait. This means that symptoms of DE are greatest around the menstrual cycle.
So far, we've discussed characteristics of DE, its symptoms and examples of common misdiagnoses persons with the disease have experienced. Now, let's take a look at a variety of other diagnoses that providers and practitioners must consider that can present similar to DE. Note, this is not an exhaustive list. Differential diagnoses include angina, aortic dissection, appendicitis, asthma, bronchitis, cardiac abnormalities, cervical spine disorders, costochondritis, esophageal reflux, gallbladder disease, gastritis, heartburn, intercostal rib muscle strain, pancreatitis, peptic ulcer, pericarditis, a pleural effusion, pleurisy, pneumonia, pneumothorax, pulmonary embolism, respiratory infection, and thoracic outlet syndrome. It's also possible to experience myofascial pain originating from the pelvic floor and the abdominal pelvic cavity. This should be a significant consideration in persons that experience pelvic endometriosis and adhesive disease. In addition, persons with pelvic endometriosis often experience pelvic floor dysfunction. There is an alteration in the flexibility, strength, and coordination of the pelvic floor muscles, particularly the timing between the respiratory diaphragm and the pelvic floor muscles movement during respiration can create symptoms of shortness of breath and pressure in the chest. This is quite common during the menstrual cycle. It's important to note that a pleural effusion and or pneumothorax can also occur secondary to the presence of diaphragmatic endometriosis and the patient therefore should be questioned in regards to their menses. As mentioned earlier, DE has a catamenial characteristic to it. Symptoms appear strongest around the immediate premenses and into the menses. These symptoms are cyclic. They tend to recur during menses and they may or may not occur every month. To clarify, as disease progresses, symptoms may appear bimonthly around the days of ovulation and menses. As the composition evolves and properties of fibrosis increase, symptoms may extend the entire month without reprieve but the symptoms continue to peak menses and subpeak at ovulation. If you are a person who suspects having DE or a medical provider practitioner who encounters a person suspicious for DE, a self-advocacy tools kit is available on a PDF at our homepage at Extra Pelvic Not Rare. The PDF provides tools to help track and record symptoms. After about three continuous months of tracking, patterns of cyclicity are often detected. My doctor said that if it doesn't show up on imaging, then nothing's wrong. False. Although the technical aspects of imaging continues to evolve and our understanding of the disease, the ability to distinguish endometriosis lesions from artifact needs further refinement to improve its sensitivity. To date, we know a normal image does not exclude the presence of endometriosis on the diaphragm. Imaging is not a diagnostic tool for endometriosis, but it can be used to support the diagnosis of DE. CT is considered first line imaging. It is significantly lower cost than MRI. However, it exposes the person to radiation and provides very little soft tissue details. This is particularly important for the diaphragm with its minimal thickness and position between two layers of air. MRI is significantly more expensive than CT, but doesn't expose a person to radiation. It also provides greater detail of soft tissue structures. MRI used to assess for DE is 78 to 83% sensitive. This equates to 17 to 20% of DE lesions will be missed by MRI. Characters discussed earlier contribute to detectability by imaging. These include the shape of the lesion, such as nodules, plaques, and superficial, the size of the lesion, large versus small, the depth of the lesion, deep or superficial, the composition of the lesion, percentage of glands or fibrosis, and the timing of imaging relative to the person's menses.
The left side of the diaphragm can easily be seen from traditional incision sites used for gynecological procedures, but the liver blocks a large portion of the right diaphragm from direct visualization using a standard scope. Modifications are necessary to visualize the entire right diaphragm. These may include altering the patient's position, using additional incision sites to see behind the liver, or tools that mobilize the liver, as well as alternate scopes that allow a larger visual field. Surgeons with a specialty in excision of endometriosis from the diaphragm routinely integrate modifications for full access and visualization of the area. This is coupled with the use of advanced skills and knowledge about endometriosis to completely eradicate the disease. Comments such as this are routinely posted in our online support group by persons who've had a laparoscopy. To recall, a laparoscopy is a minimally invasive surgery where small incisions are used to gain access to the abdominal pelvic cavity. The umbilicus or belly button is the most frequently located position for cameras to be inserted for viewing. Unless an injury or an intraoperative procedure occurred that gives passage into one side of the chest cavity through the diaphragm, the lungs and chest cavity cannot be seen during laparoscopy. In this image, the abdominal organs are removed to allow a view of the entire diaphragm. The two holes seen here are passageway for the large blood vessels, the esophagus, nerves, and lymphatics to pass. Some considerations include the surgeon's ability to recognize endometriosis lesions by their shape and color. Active lesions have been mistaken for scarring. Endometriosis lesions do occur on the chest side of the diaphragm only. These lesions cannot be seen using traditional laparoscopy or the use of modified techniques. These lesions can only be visualized through a video-assisted thoracic surgery, or VAPS. The last consideration we discuss is the possibility of symptom referral from other local organs and tissues or referral from remote areas to include the pelvic floor. Literature is available with documented characteristics of DE in regards to visceral or abdominal side only lesions, thoracic, chest side only lesions, and full thick lesions that affect both sides of the diaphragm. A video-assisted thoracoscopy is performed by a thoracic surgeon or a general surgeon who is credentialed to perform such procedures. It is vital for the surgical team to work together intraoperatively. Although the surgeon performing the VATS is skilled to remove pathology from the chest, it's vital for the experienced excision gynecologist to be present to assist identification of all disease, which can be very subtle in appearance and easily missed. Thank you for joining me. I hope you've learned a lot of new information today about diaphragmatic endometriosis. We do not know the true prevalence of this condition, but at present, it's clearly underrecognized, underdiagnosed, misdiagnosed, and undertreated. Don't forget to visit our homepage to download the Self Advocacies Toolkit. I am your host, Dr. Wendy Bingham, wishing wellness to you all. Thank you.